crescent technology, but I still put geospatial above all of that. Um, you know, just the significance it plays, and, and, not, and I'm not just talking about to, to IDOT. It's, it's a critical technology. It, it, it is mission critical to an agency like IDOT. And, um, you know, when we look out, when I look out, and here I'm retiring, you know, almost 40 years of, of being involved in technology, and when we look out to the next 40 years, you know, what is, what is that going to be, or even 20 years? I think you're going to hear some things today um, that, that kind of give you a glimpse, and you probably are seeing it in, you know, in, in the media, things that are happening. Sure, we know about automated autonomous vehicles. Um, it's coming, I think, uh, and it's coming sooner than we probably all think. It's, and is that geospatial? For sure, it is. Um, you know, 3D is, is coming at us. We're, uh, in the CAD group, you know, Dan's group, they're, they're very much involved in 3D from both CAD and you know, model-based design, and then obviously in, in GIS. Well, those are those are coming at us for sure, and and it's exciting stuff. But you know, beyond that, when you look to um, you know immersive technology, the thing that it's, you know it's a bit of a joke, I guess that you know Zuckerberg has rebranded Facebook as as Meta. You know, maybe that was a just a move to distract from some of the things that he's in the news for that are problematic, but. You know, at the same time, you know, that that's focused on, on what immersive technology can be, you know, for society. Maybe you've got something right there. And, and again, I think geospatial is is part of that. It's, it's critical to um, the new technologies that are on the horizon and that are going to be here soon enough. Business intelligence, you know, machine learning. I think there's other items on the agenda today where you're going to hear some about, uh, you know, using deep learning within geospatial. So that's you know, impressive stuff and exciting stuff. So like I said, I want to let this get back on schedule. Um, you know, when I look at IDOT, when I look at the work across the states that's done in GIS, you know, I'm, I'm immensely proud of that. I'm proud of people that do the work. Um, I'm proud of the, you know, what it delivers and the value it brings to the state of Illinois. Um, I'm envious. Like I said, I wish I could have spent more time when I look back. You know, I won't, I certainly won't say I wish I set in more meetings, but I will say I wish I had done a lot more with geospatial. Um, but you guys are, are there. Uh, you're, you're the evangelist. The, the work you do in geospatial technology, the skills and the knowledge you bring to, to the state and what you deliver to your organization is, uh, is tremendously valuable. So keep up the good work. And with that, I will, I think, hand it back to Dan for the rest of the agenda. All right. Well, thanks, Dan. Appreciate the kind words. And again, we're going to miss you, uh, miss you uh, very much. So, uh, with that, I think we'll get on to the first agenda item, uh, which is an Illinois State Plan Court System update. So, uh, John Miller and I. Uh, so, I'm Dan Malaknik for those on online from the uh, IDOT Bureau of Design and Environment, and I'm the Illinois State Plan Court System. Ordinance System Committee Chair, and with me is John Miller, who is the Technical Committee Chair, and we're going to give you an update on uh, some changes coming to the Illinois coordinate systems and how they affect users. So with that, um, what is the ISPCS Committee? It, this is a multi multidisciplinary team consisting of surveyors, engineers, and GIS professionals. We have five state agencies involved uh, as voting members, uh, people from the county and municipal governments, Academia, we have Parkland College and the University of Illinois represented, and the related technical associations. And we have 20 individuals on the committee that are donating their time to participate and assist Illinois in developing uh, its state plan coordinate system for submittal to NGS for in inclusion in the new uh, upcoming NSRS, which is the National Spatial Reference System. And the new system, uh, currently we're on NAD83, but we'll be moving to something called NATREF 2022, the North American Terrestrial Reference Frame of 2022. So this will affect every state and U.S. territory, um, including Illinois. So uh, we developed a committee, we developed a charter for that committee, and some goals in that charter that are, that are listed here. 
uh, develop, develop a single unified response for Illinois to NGS uh, concerning our preferences of the state plane coordinate system. Um, and we had to, we uh, were challenged to do that by the end of 2019. Uh, second goal is to approve any changes made to existing state plane coordinate systems and to cause to be developed a single zone and low distortion projections. Um, and NGS gave us an additional year to come up with um, you know, once we made the recommendations by the end of 2019, we had one year to finalize those recommendations and, and submit them to NGS for inclusion into the NSRS. And then um, in order to do this, we have to provide direction for statutory changes. We have to change state law in time for NATREF 2022 to be utilized. Uh, currently, Illinois state law only allows um, NAD 27 or NAD 83 to be the law of our state, so we'll have to uh, provide statutory change recommendations um, at a time when NGS sanctions the new system. So the stakeholder involvement was uh, pretty detailed, as I mentioned previously, with 20, ent 20 voting members, but here are the, some of the state agencies involved, uh, IDOT, IDNR, uh, the State Toll Highway Authority, Department of Agriculture, Prairie Research Institute, which includes the ISGS, the Illinois State Geological Survey, uh, IPLSA, which is the Illinois Professional Land Surveyors Association, ILGISA, the Illinois GIS Association, as I said, the colleges and universities, academia, uh, that have a surveying or GIS curriculum. Uh, and as I mentioned, that was Parkland College and the University of Illinois who participated, and a couple of county municipal groups. We had Caswell and Sangamon counties represented as long as, as far as, in addition to um, just NGS and the National Society of Professional Surveyors, NSPS, that sat on a, in an um, advisory role. So in addition to those voting members and the advisors, we had um, other state agencies that we communicated uh, some of these changes to, and we invited them to participate and listen into our committee meetings, which were basically once a month for the last several years. Uh, and those agencies are Department of Revenue, IEMA, do it, uh, Department of Public Health, the State Police, and the State Terrorism and Intelligence Center. So along with that, we reviewed other state plans and proposals to make sure that we weren't missing anything or leaving anything out. Uh, we coordinated with neighboring states, uh, especially Wisconsin, very heavy um, coordination with Wisconsin. They were very helpful in the process. And along the way, you know, they told us that, uh, you know, we kind of went from zero to 60. We were behind them and we ended up accelerating and getting in front of them and they started learning from us. So uh, we kind of helped each other in this process. So our communication and outreach plan, we, we had a couple newsletters that we developed and tried to, to get out to others. Uh, you know, we I think handed these off at, at IPLSA and LGISA meetings uh, to, to just users to get the word out what's coming. Uh, of course, we presented at IPLSA, LGISA, and GIS Day now for a couple years in a row to, to kind of give updates of, of what was coming to, to users. Uh, we created a, an email address for comments that's listed here, and welcome any comments to be submitted into that email system uh, for response. We're working on public-facing website and a clearinghouse for sharing all of the, the new projections and data, and we continue with discussions with our software and equipment vendors on getting uh, this information into their systems. So you might ask, what's the problem? You know, what, 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 what are we tackling, what's the, and what's the solution to the problem? And so just at a basic level, the, the problem is that um, currently published projections such as the Illinois State Plain East and West zones have distortion magnitudes that are easily detectable by current survey technology. So this doesn't necessarily affect every GIS user, but we have to consider both this, you know, all disciplines in, in the changes that were coming. So we have to, you know, surveyors and the GIS users and professionals, uh, engineers, the contracting community, everyone has to be on the same page. Uh, and also our equipment vendors and uh, software manufacturers. Everybody has to be on board with the changes and they have to, uh, you know, we can't have one discipline control the other. So everybody had to have a voice in what was coming. <clears throat> so something called low distortion projections or LDPs create a, a grid distance that is approx approximately equal to ground distance. And this was what we looked at moving beyond a two zone system 
to more zones that would eliminate these these issues that affect um, mostly the surveying and engineering community, but can also affect GIS users depending on what what type of geospatial information and you know, how they want to show it on their map. Um, so LDPs attempt to minimize the distortion to the point that they're undetectable or insignificant. And without the use of these scale factors that engineers or that surveyors are very used to, to utilizing, and you know, their utilization can lead to errors in the field, repeat, repeatability problems in the future. So uh, eliminating that, that scale factor is, was an important uh, part of this in moving to this low distortion projection uh, system. And we'll kind of get into that. We're, we're really not calling it a low distortion projection system. That was the initial uh, verbiage for it. We're kind of moving beyond that now because at one point, you know, in this whole process, it was it was stated that a two-zone system that we're currently on was a low distortion projection. And as technology increased, um, you know, we now are moving to a, a system that uh, is more than two zones and calling it a low distortion projection. But what's to say 20 years from now that we we don't, you know, survey detection or surveyed equip, equipment doesn't detect uh, that, that uh, distortion, and we move to a new system that has even less distortion and, and call that low distortion projection. So we're taking that verbiage out of the equation. So in the past, you kind of heard this referred to as an LDP system. We're now referring it as the 33 zone system, and we'll get to that here in a little bit and show you what that means. But you know, just a, a visual, you know, what, what is this grid to ground uh, distortion issue? Uh, depending where the, you know, where you are on the Earth's surface, that that same distance can be different depending on the elevation changes at the Earth, um, the topography. So that this is just a kind of a visual of, of the, the, that projection onto a grid system and how there could be different uh, lengths for something that you might think are the same lengths uh, if you're just talking about them in. Uh, generalities, but in, in essence, when we're actually looking at something like surveying, those uh, those distances can cause a distortion that can cause issues. So this is just kind of a visual of how those di distances could be uh, measured differently. So on top of all this is this move to international feet. So the U.S. survey foot is being deprecated by NGS and the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, at the end of next December, so December of 2022. So the question is, so what really is a foot in, in meters? Uh, the U.S. survey foot actually uses the, you know, it's a repeating decimal. One foot is 0 0.304800 ongoing, um, 612, it, it just continues. That number continues indefinitely. And, and so it can cause some issues with uh, rounding. So technically, the international foot has been the law since 1959, and that definition of the foot is that one foot is equal to exactly 0 0.3048 meters. So by removing that repeating decimal, it makes, um, you know, there's benefits, including the ability to convert projection systems between feet and meters exactly throughout the world. And as the world becomes more connected and as uh, technology involves and, you know, the English world or the, you know, North America or the United States using um, English system and the rest of the world using a metric system, it, it really matters um, in sharing these coordinate systems. So by moving to the international feet, we can eliminate any issues between the two and uh, make them very easily, uh, you, know, trans you know, you can translate between the two. And there's a ton of information on this topic and why uh, the United States is moving to the international foot on ngs.noaa.gov. So, Illinois is the middle. On uh, March 10th of this year, uh, we submitted our recommendations for our state claim coordinate system to NGS. Uh, this middle included a 33 zone layer and a, a statewide single zone layer. And so, some people might be thinking, well, if, if there's such a uh, problem with the two zone layer, why do we need a single zone layer? But for the GIS community that are working more at a state level, uh, you know, state agencies, they don't necessarily need to, to utilize 33 zones. They, they don't need that, that accuracy, but what they want is a single map where all their information can be laid on one, um, you know, one uh, coordinate system. So for, for the users that do not need that uh, accuracy, you know, there was 
uh, guidance recommendations from our committee that we, we needed a single zone. So these zones will be included in our submittal or were included in our submittal to NGS. They will be tied to the new datum, uh, NATRAF 2022, and there'll be an international fee. However, with NGS announcing that they will not come out with NATRAF 2022 until at least 2025, uh, due to a couple, you know, there's a delay due to a couple of government shutdowns and then COVID, um, they were unable to, they had some planes that they had to ground, that they were in, unable to collect some data uh, during COVID. So this is all delayed their implementation plan. And so they're saying at earliest it would be at 2025 or it could even be later. And so you know, we have this technology at our disposal at this point in time and we didn't want to wait. Uh, we didn't want to um, you know, wait for five years and, and, and utilizing the technology. So we, you know, our committee, you know, we were hearing it from users, especially on the surveying side, we'd like, to, we'd like to see this now. So we developed the same 33 zones and tied them to the current coordinate system, NAD 83, or the current datum, and uh, left them in U.S. survey fee, which is still currently uh, part of NAD 83. And so we have released that information as of this November, November 1st of 2021, to users, and we've been uh, kind of communicating what's out there and available to the surveying and GIS community through presentations. And uh, in addition to that uh, LDP or that 33 zone layer, we also have developed a conversion tool called ILCAT to convert between existing and future Illinois uh, specific projections. There's a tool that NGS uses call, all, online called NCAT. Um, it's their conversion tool and we developed a similar uh, program for Illinois conversions uh, of systems that were not adopted by NGS. So it's a way to get between the two systems and convert those coordinate systems um, accurately. So here is the Illinois uh, coordinate system of 1983, 33 zone layer. Uh, so these are the 33 zones on the the only map, uh, the zones were constructed by merging counties. So the boundaries are based on county boundaries, uh, but some counties are independent and they have their own zone. Others are merged with an adjacent county. And we, we used NGS's guidelines to create these zones. They had specific guidelines for size. We couldn't, for example, just go to 102 zones for 102 counties. We had to, to utilize NGS's guidelines to get us to this uh, proposal. So as we mentioned, this was submitted for inclusion. Uh, it's become available already in CAD and GIS software, and we're working with our survey equipment and software vendors to move this into the survey equipment uh, soon. It's meant that these 33 zones would supersede the, east, the current east and west zone system, and uh, the future you know, the, the current, what we're calling ICS 83 system and the future ICS 2022 system will both use this 33 zone configuration. It's just that when the new datum comes out, those coordinates will move ever so slightly to uh, co coexist with the, the new datum. So you'll get a different XY value depending where you are in the state, but the boundaries and the regions will not change for your 33 zones. And here's just a uh, visual of, you know, the the current two zone system versus the 33 zone layer and the differences, the, you know, the major improvement and distortion. So on the right side is the existing east-west zone and you know, the, more the, the more green you see, the better. Um, as you move to blue, you have distortion over 30 parts per million. Uh, NGS's guidelines for the new system were that we would be in the 20 or negative, you know, between 20 and negative 20 parts per million that's more in that uh, very light blue range. So the existing two zone, zone system was not going to work for us. However, with the 33 zone system, we were able to dramatically improve distortion. And as you can see there, I think almost 82% of the state is between five and negative five parts per million. This is almost undetectable. It's a very, very uh, minuscule, I think it amounts to about a, a hundredth of a foot over a mile of distortion. And 100% uh, of the, the state is within uh, negative 20 and 20 parts per million. And 
you know, we created 33 zone raster distortion graphics, we're, we're calling them. This shows the exact region, uh, you know, one of the regions, and its distortion uh, on that topography in that area. And in addition to that, we show a six mile buffer. So what you see in red is the county or the zone boundary that is also based on county boundaries. And then in the tan outside of that is a six mile buffer um, just to get the user some information about if they had to cross a county boundary, what would the distortion look like? Um, you know, there's no, there's no um, dead pass rule that you have to switch a coordinate system when you cross the county boundary. You might have a small job that extends into two different counties, and the intent is that you would not necessarily need to have a different coordinate system every time you cross a boundary. Those are not hard lines. It's kind of a gray area, and it's up to the user to look at the adjacent information or the adjacent coordinate system and, and determine which coordinate system works best for them. So again, the benefits, uh, this, this system, the 33 zone system improves distortion and eliminates the potential for grid ground conversion errors. Um, these improvements you know, will affect surveyors, roadway designers, and engineers, um, you know, the whole construction and contractor industry. And you know, as we move to the use of 3D models, which Dan Wilcox mentioned earlier, and as we move those models from design out into construction out in the field using automated machine guidance and GPS equipment, this will have a dramatic effect on the construction industry as well because those users will not need to be a uh, you know, a professional land surveyor necessarily, they just need to know what region of the state they're in, pick that zone and put it into the system and they'll have a very, very accurate um, coordinate system uh, using the, the latest technology. And of course, this will also affect counties and GIS users. And that single statewide projection, as we mentioned earlier, will be very beneficial to county and state agencies that rely and develop position data uh, on features throughout the entire state. Now, if you work for a county and you could just pick that, um, that low distortion projection zone in your area and wouldn't have to necessarily worry about the, the statewide zone, you'll have a much more accurate um, coordinate system that you're working with because you're not working with county boundaries outside of your, your region. So th they'll have a couple of different options for coordinate systems moving forward if you don't quite need the positional accuracy of a surveyor and you're working more in that GIS discipline. So the future is now, uh, the 33 zone layer and the new single zone layer are already, um, as we mentioned, out there and John Miller is gonna give a little bit more information on that, uh, what, you know, what this means to the user and where they can find that information. Uh, the, these layers are intended to supersede previous systems. Uh, the projection systems are being developed for use in CAD and GIS software and surveying equipment. State legislation will need to be changed at the appropriate time to allow the usage for the new datum, MATRAF 2022, and communication of the changes is, you know, and, and putting this information at a one-stop shop is going to be very important for all the all users. Um, one thing to mention here is our current state legislation. Right now, this is uh, an excerpt out of it, and you know, what's highlighted there, the Illinois coordinate system. So. It has called this for years, you know, our adopted system, the Illinois coordinate system. So it's never really referred to anything as ICS. So we took this um, kind of straight from, uh, you know, existing legislation and said, well, from now on, I, we feel that this should be called the Illinois coordinate system of, and then that year. So, um, you know, we have NAD 83, so we're calling that, uh, that parallel Illinois specific part of NAD 83, ICS 83. Previous to that, we had NAD 27, so we're going back in time and kind of referring to that as ICS 27. And then, of course, we'll have ICS 2022 that's coming out. So we just kind of went back to legislation to make sure that we're consistent. And so although many users haven't heard of ICS before, we're kind of using that nomenclature moving forward and kind of going back to our history to name some of the systems that were used in the past so that there won't be, um, you know, uh, confusion as we move forward. So the statewide legislative changes that are necessary, you know, we don't need those now to start using ICS 83. The 33 zones and the existing 2002 statewide single zone, which many GIS users might be familiar, um, it's called it, you know, it's been called the Pearson projection. Um, we're kind of getting away from calling it after 
a single individual. So now we're referring it to it as the 2002 statewide single zone. But we do not need uh, to change legislation to utilize these system, you know, these layers of our existing system. But we will to move to the new system in 2020, NATRAF 2022. And at that time, IDOT and IDNR legislative staff will kind of move this forward. Uh, we feel that two state agencies kind of pushing this uh, with legislation will give it more weight and it should be a, a you know a slam dunk getting it through legislative changes and implemented um, you know at in time when we hear more word from NGS and that legislation will be provided in a draft form through IDOT and IDNR we'll be moving that through um, IPLSA and, and ILGISA for comment so we have a system in place ready uh, to move the legislation at the time when NGS announces that implementation is imminent. So we've probably got a couple of years before that um, needs to take us back. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to John Miller, who's going to take us the rest of the way, kind of sh share uh, the, the information that we've developed over time and what we have for users and where that information can be found. All right. Uh... First off, hello. Uh, my name is John Meller. Welcome to GIS Day 2021. Um, like Dan said, uh, we're moving to this uh, nomenclature. I want to talk a minute about the name, the naming uh, uh, guideline or system as this uh, notion of, of ICS as, as kind of the beginning of the name. So on the screen, you can see uh, three different colors. You've got the yellow, the red, and the purple, right? So yellow is going to be uh, connected to uh, 1927. Red is going to be connected to 1983. And the purple will be what's coming in uh, 2022. So the purple piece is what the committee worked on building, okay? The 33 zones. If you If you look at the bottom of the red and, the, and all of the purple, they match. The boundaries are the same, the names are the same, the difference will be the datum, right? So the color code is connected to the datum, yellow 27, red 83, and uh, purple or lavender, whatever color you see there, uh, is uh, 2022. Just like Dan said, um, the ink is something we couldn't we felt we couldn't wait for um, NGS to come out with the uh, I don't know, the new NSRS. So uh, we went ahead and, and uh, released this uh, 1983 version. So uh, to me, this poster is one of the most important parts of everything we've done in the last two years. It kind of puts the name in, in uh, for all the projections uh, together. You'll see a gray bar down the left-hand side, uh, and that talks about units. There's going to be U.S. feet, international feet, meters. And then further to the left, you're going to see a little box. And a little box um, is uh, the name of the coordinate system as uh, NGS recognizes it, right? So state plane coordinate system for NGS. So again, to this poster, to where it says SPCS, that's going to be NGS recognized or NGS supported, and that's also going to line up with our legislation. So anything outside of those boxes um, will be state recognized, but not NGS recognized. Um, next slide. So. This poster would probably be the second most important poster. And what this does, it takes all of those projections.
technology, am I right? So uh, this would be the second most important piece. And what this does, it, put, it, uh, it takes everything from the previous poster that we were showing you, the yellow and, and uh, red and purple, and puts it on a map, right? So um, how many times have you tried to recognize a projection based on a coordinate pair, right? So this will be the piece that helps you with that. This, this contains the proposed single state for 2022 area. It's the diagonal line. It, it's got the 1927 stuff. It even has the district A 2016 low, uh, low distortion projections. So between these two, you should really be able to tell where, where you're at. All right, so we're, we're GIS people, what, what's coming? You know, what, what am I gonna see? Where am I going to find information? So to answer these questions, changes are coming, right? NGS says, hey, we're, we're coming out with a new NSRS based on tectonic plates. And so as the crust of the earth shifts, we're going to add the time or temporal dimension to the coordinate pair, to the location. And then like Dan said, they, you know, through uh, for reasons that, that they couldn't control, there's a delay. All right. So then we say, what, what, do these, what do these changes mean to me? Well, it means that you could be seeing data in a different projection now, right? So um, there's going to be all the terminology. There's going to be the, the questions that are asked of you. Um, you know, am I going to say the east-west zone is going to go away? Um, I, I'd love to say that and say it no longer exists. That's not the case, right? We just talked about the east-west zone of 1927. That's almost 100 years old, and we're still talking about it. But the new stuff will supersede. It will be what the surveyor in the field is using at, at the beginning of the collection to get better accuracy. So we'll we'll need to know when that comes to our desk, what they did, how they did it. So where do I go get information about this? We'll go to the ISGS Clearinghouse. They were one of our, our partners on the committee. Um, and this is absolutely the data repository for this information. Um, we worked with Esri. We said, we said to Esri, hey, we need your help on this. You guys have a wonderful product that projects and transforms on the fly. And we thought it was going to be a difficult conversation. It took about 12 minutes. They said, yeah, we can do that. How about in our next release? And we were like, yeah, that's great. So if you're using ArcGIS Pro 2.9 version, you can grab these projections on the fly now. They're, they're, already, in, they're already in your software. For Bentley, the uh, CAD manufacturer in their microstation ORD 10.10. Um, one, one of the guys in our group uh, built all three uh, 33 zones in custom projections and embedded it in the, in the um, CAD software. So what does this mean? This means it's in CAD now as well uh, for, for the CAD IDOT. And then the final thing is we're, we're working to get all this now over to EPSG, and that's the big clearinghouse for all projections. So we talked a little bit about what, what will it look like. This is a screenshot of the ISGS website. Um, you can see in, in this uh, view that there's the summary, the data, the viewer, and the um, stakeholders. So the data tab, when we blow that up, this is what it looks like. And in here, I can grab a, a, a single projection, or I'm sorry, a single zone. I can go uh, click on the distortion map and see the map, like what Dan was showing with the, uh, with the boundary. In fact, we, we just used this yesterday. There was a big project, it's crossing two of the zones, and we said which zone would be best. Normally we say, well, wherever most of the project is. But now we can put some new thought into that and say, wait a minute, where's the best distortion? Uh, and how does the overlapping distortion 
help or hurt. Third tab over is a viewer tab. I can click on the area that I want to look at and uh, I can pop up what counties it's in. I can pop up what projection is. I can download the projection, um, you know, load it in my data collector. What does it look like in Esri? Okay. So you can go to the search and just type in Illinois and you're going to see uh, GCSs and PCSs uh, in the PCS. You're going to be looking for county system. Even though it's a statewide system, it falls into the county system uh, tier. So search Illinois PCS county systems. Under county systems, you see the Illinois folder. They, they gave us their, our own folder here. Boom, 33 zones right there. Like I say, ArcGIS Pro. Um, it's on the fly. How about desktop? You think they're going to go back and put it in desktop? Probably not, right? They're done. Nope. Esri said, hey, you know what? We can put it in the Q1 2022 release of desktop. Again, you'll search for it the same way. Now, this is a, a forecast of what it would look like uh, if you were in, say, CAD software and connect up to uh, you know, drill down through your folders for EPSG. We did not have the opportunity to grab a screenshot of the custom um, projections that uh, our guys built in um, in the IDOT uh, ORD 10.10 release, but it should have been included here. So we talked about ILCAT, and uh, Dan talked about ILCAT is the Illinois tool for navigating through the different projections, right? Just like NCAT is the national tool, um, you can um, manipulate ILCAT through command line or you can use the uh, graphical user interface, the dialog box. Uh, you can batch file with this or you can do a single set of points. You can take from, you know, uh, an east NAT 83 and put it to an East NAT 83, but just change the units from international feet to meters. Or you can actually change the projection and get the new uh, coordinate pair. By the way, that ILCAT is also on the ISGS website. So it is the one-stop shop for all of this information. And with that, uh, I think we're open for questions. Any questions online? Um, I don't know if anybody's checking the chat box. Is there anything that's coming up that way or from anybody here in person? Yeah. The question from the chat. Uh, Kathy read to us was about how was the number of 33 zones determined, and uh, you know, so you know, Chris Perchner from IDOT was pretty instrumental. He developed a, a Python uh, program that looked at distortion. He plugged in the, the NGS parameters. You know, there's certain size uh, limitations, and put, put all these parameters into that software. And you know, there was a, kind of an iterative process. We didn't just come to 33 zones overnight. Um, but we utilized that, that Python program to, to determine potential geographic re regions, and we kept it, you know, as we mentioned, uh, on the county boundaries. I mean, there was some talk about, you know, even moving them to township boundaries and things like that, but uh, and maybe we can improve distortion further, but we thought there, that would be very uh, cumbersome and confusing to, to users. So we stuck with county boundaries at the end of the day, and, you know, we – we uh, utilize those boundaries, you know, whether it's a Lambert conformic or a transverse Mercator, you know, we, we had to put uh, different parameters in, you know, whether, you know, basically if the coordinate um, centroid is going to run north, south, or east, west, and put all this in, in as options and just kind of ran this program. And that's what kind of got us to 33. There for a while, we kind of had centered on 32, and we thought 32 was going to be our number. And then we looked at 
um, survey distortion, especially in the Chicago area. So Chicago ended up getting its own uh, zone. We took 30, uh, we moved to 33. We took the Chicago zone and broke into Chicago and Joliet because there was some major distortion uh, that was approaching uh, NGS's threshold and it was a, it was along I-55 and I-80. So it was right in a very urban area where there, there was a lot of um, surveying that could potentially be going on in the future. You know, it, it was kind of confluence of two state or two interstate highways. A lot of surveyors could be working in that area and they're gonna have some distortion issues. So we looked at breaking it into two zones and we moved to Chicago and Joliet and it dramatically improved uh, distortion there along you know, the, the interstate network. So we had the last you know, the 11th hour moved to a 33 zone system. So, but that program was very integral and the program was so uh, widely accepted that NGS was floored. They really um, gave us some high praise for developing the program. Uh, other states like Wisconsin saw it and wanted to copy. Uh, so this thing kind of had some national potential that you know, everybody was wanting to utilize this program to determine the best distortion in their state and you know we're kind of um, wary of giving it to others and utilizing it. I mean, if, if you do, you will have to obviously be at their discretion. But we have not released it to other states or NGS yet. It's kind of a an IDOT developed program. So uh, I think that answers that question. Um, any other questions online or from the people here in person? Anything else? All right, with that, thank you.